I'm sure today we're going to hear a lot about the national defense strategy. And um, that document talks about an increased use of unmanned platforms. What are some of the obstacles that um, are preventing the Department of Defense and the military from adopting unmanned platforms more, more regularly? Yeah, so there are um, a number of issues associated with that. As we all we all know and have talked about it and as in, in many different forums and opportunities and occasions, uh, the trusted capital obviously is an issue for the Department of Defense, making sure that um, the, the, the availability of technology is um, to some extent curtailed from our enemies, and at the same time making sure that there's enough of an industrial base uh, in the U.S. to address the growing needs of UAS. Now that's just one issue. That's just one potential issue. But there are others. There are uh, concerns about the change of uh, technology, um, uh, integration, and advancement, if you wish, the rate of innovation. Along with that comes uh, concerns and issues associated with affordability of our products. And, and I would also say that there's potentially... Um, uh, some difficulties these days, especially lately associated with the way uh, some of the um, procurement processes and approaches have been promoted um, by various branches of the Department of Defense. I think all of those are major issues that um, do contribute to some of the limitations in our capabilities today. So let's say we I give you uh, you know this a magic wand and you can solve some of these problems. Um, you know, in a day or in a couple of days. <laughs> what, but what <laughs> steps would you take to to help reinvigorate the marketplace here then? Yeah, so I wish I had a magic wand. Uh, thank you for giving me that glimpse of a potential future for myself. But <laughs> I would tell you that, um, you know, today, as I mentioned, the DOD likes the change and the pace of uh change in the commercial market. It's kind of important to keep that in mind and understand that we as a community are all you know, in favor of faster, cheaper, and better. Uh, but we need to have and exercise some caution when we do that. Um, the, our past is full of examples of when we do those kinds of things, we tend to sacrifice one versus the other, and I won't get into the, all the details. We need to not lose sight of the fact that what we need is a balance uh, between all those desires and the fact that what the end user needs is actionable intelligence and a certain bit of tactical advantage in the field. As we like to say at AV, what that end user needs is the ability to proceed with certainty. At the end of the day, that warfighter um, on the edge of the battlefield uh, needs to have a product that is secure to have a product that is trusted and and it needs to be able to work every single time um, members of our community to some extent have that as part of our dna uh, the dna of working with uh, the end user to solve those problems i guess the, the best advice and the best way i would approach this is work the problem backwards if we can focus on working the problem backwards from the end user and address what they need, we will all do better. You know, at the end of the day, um, we have an 18 to 25 year old in, right at the edge of the battlefield and we're asking them to do some pretty, pretty difficult missions. And our job number one is to give them the information they need, more importantly, make sure that they come back safe. Yeah, and, and so let me let me flip it to what, what kind of steps can you can you do an industry or, or what steps can industry take to, to do exactly what you said? Think about the end user to get, to get the product that, that kind of suits everyone's needs. Yeah. So as I mentioned, uh, you need to have a certain degree of um, connection with the end user. Um, what I mean by that is you need to understand the missions. The best thing the community can do, the industry can do, is to make sure they understand the details and the intricacies of the various missions that our warfighters are fighting. The days of a simple um, ISR mission, for all intents and purposes, are behind us. And, and the battlefield is changing, the threat environment is changing, 
we as as industry and as community have to redouble our efforts to make sure we fully understand uh, the mission requirements. And and I wish I could tell you it's one mission or two missions, but it's a multitude of missions. Along that line, I think we need to outline our technology roadmaps and our product roadmaps in addressing mission needs as opposed to um, a specific product that does A, B, or C. It, you know, it's we are becoming more and more part of a mesh, a mesh of various capabilities, an integrated battlefield that is multi-domain. And if you approach solving problems from that top-down view versus the bottoms-up view, you come up with a completely different set of requirements for your products when you go through that decomposition process. So I guess the best thing for us to do is to, is to recognize that time is here for us to start looking at mission capabilities as opposed to individual product capabilities and build in them features that allow mission success as opposed to a specific um, product capability. And last question, I know, I know you kind of touched on this, but, but how does America kind of compete and how does industry compete in this, in this marketplace? What stands out? What is kind of an American attribute of the, the drone marketplace that will make it, make it valuable to DOD? Yeah, so, so I would say, number one, America invented the stitch phone business to begin with. Uh, this is purely, for all intents and purposes, an American invention. We like to claim that we invented the small UAS business 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago. But uh, th that's a major uh, you know, a differentiation between the U.S. industry and the rest of the world. Um, that's item number one. Item number two is, I think we are collectively at a forefront uh, of cutting-edge technology and integration of that, those technologies into our UAS system. There's a significant level of uh, focus these days on what we call, um, you've heard of, I'm sure it's called the autonomy. And, and some of the, um, what you might call adjacent technologies that make it work like machine learning. It, it's very, very important for people to recognize there's a fundamental difference between automation and autonomy. Uh, going from point A to point B is automation, but being able to make higher order decisions in the execution of a mission with human intervention, that's the real differentiation for, for autonomy. So I would say what separates us is our really increased focus on, on autonomy. Uh, many companies, including us, are putting significant amount of investment in being able to really lighten the cognitive load on the operator and and enable the execution of far more complex and complicated missions in a far more complex battlefield environment, which, by the way, is being executed against an adversary who's significantly more capable than they were 15, 20 years ago, and we have no other choice but to label them as either a peer or a near peer adversary. Great. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hosefian. Thanks for setting the stage for this discussion we have.